This is kind of a different topic from everything else basically that we'll cover uh, in the course because it's not a functional neuroimaging method. That's why it's called structural. Um, and most of our interest in trying to relate brain to cognition is necessarily about functional imaging because that's really where we're measuring changes or things that actually are going on in a sort of moment to moment uh, sort of fashion when cognition is happening. Whereas structural imaging is really sort of the state of the brain or the, the, the matrix in which all of this happens, but we don't expect that the structure is really changing significantly from moment to moment as cognition is happening. Now at like a subcellular level, we know now that uh, synaptic connections are quite dynamic and do sort of change uh, on a moment to moment basis with experience. Uh, and that's probably a mechanism for plasticity and lots of other things. We can't study things at that level with structural non-invasive neuroimaging, so we're not really sensitive to that sort of thing. But still there's an interest in uh, looking at the structure of the brain because ultimately everything that we do, you know, functionally is imposed on that structure. And that structure supports what's going on cognitively and functionally. And so if we don't understand that, we don't really have a good way of understanding the functional uh, capacities. And to some extent, we, you can imagine that the or the, sorry, the structural imaging could constrain our theories and hypotheses about functional imaging. Because if we know that you know, areas aren't directly connected to each other, then clearly if we see a functional connectivity pattern, for example, that's not coming from that, but there, there must be some intermediate uh, sort of brain area. So there, there's definitely uh, some value to doing this. Um, and also in terms of interpreting, you know, sort of where blobs of activation occur and so on, um, which I'll get to in a minute. All right, so this really starts with the development of cytoarchitectonic maps. And this goes back to really the, the late 19th century. And uh, there's this quote from Paul Broca, um, who was a, a physician and uh, was sort of the first person to really convincingly associate damage to a particular brain area, which now bears his name, Broca's area, with a particular functional deficit. Um, but he has this quote, I had thought that if there were ever a phrenological science, it would be the phrenology of convolutions and not the phrenology of bumps. So remember, phrenology was bump feeling the bumps on your skull and associating those with functions. And Broca's point here is really that, you know, that's kind of silly because we know that the brain is soft and squishy and it's not pushing out the skull. But at the same time, there does seem to be some value in this notion that the, the convolutions of the brain itself um, or the gross anatomy of the brain reflect some level of organization and that, you know, everything in the brain isn't doing everything, but there's some sort of localization of function. And uh, sort of independent of that, uh, Carl, or sorry, Cor Corbinian, I find that name a little hard to say, Corbinian Brodman, 1909 wrote, uh, the specific histological differentiation of cortical areas provides irrefutable proof of their specific functional differentiation. And so he was actually studying uh, brain areas at the cellular level and looking at structural differences and showing that across the cortex, different brain areas actually had different cytoarchitectures, so different patterns of cell bodies and cell densities and so on. And basically what he's saying is, well, if different brain areas have different structures, they must be doing different things because why else, like, they couldn't possibly ha all have different structures and do the same thing. That just doesn't make sense, right? Um, so a large number of distinct structural zones suggest a spatial specialization of various individual functions. And finally, the all around sharp demarcation of many areas, so in other words, having sort of very clear boundaries between areas, indicates inexorably a strictly circumscribed localization of their corresponding physiological function. Um, today seems to be the day of quoting big wordy uh, sorts of things. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, he's basically saying that there must be some localization of function because the structure of the brain suggests it. Uh, and this is obviously pre uh, any functional imaging by about 100 years. Um, but that's really, again, highlighting the value of doing this uh, sort of structural work is, you know, what we see functionally should line up with what we understand to be the functional structure of the brain. And so if there are areas that are structurally defined as being distinctive, then we would expect that those areas would behave differently in functional uh, sorts of tasks. And we might actually eventually gain some greater insight into you know, what different areas are doing, the kinds of processing they're doing or something, if we understand more about their, their fine-grained structure. So Broadman did a lot of that work.
uh, and uh, his contemporaries, uh, uh, the votes, um, Oscar and Cecile, uh, also did this work. So um, uh, Bodman was doing it in, um, uh, I think, Leipzig, and they were in uh, Ulick or Dusseldorf. Uh, uh, but working on, on sort of similar things, but from different approaches. So Brodman was doing cytoarchitecture, so you take slices of brain tissue, stain them with stains that are sensitive to cell bodies, look at it under a microscope, and you see things like these bottom pictures here. And you uh, basically sort of, as you start looking at these things, get a sense of different types of cells and their, their distribution across the cortical layers. So the cortex in the human has six layers. And you can see here, there's sort of a distinct layer at the top and at least one other layer that sort of pops out that there's some larger black, larger black cells uh, there that seem to form a layer. Uh, and there's an arrow there which indicates actually a boundary between two different cytoarchitectonically defined areas. That boundary might not be super obvious to you, but you can see maybe there's m sort of more of those big black blobs on the left side of the arrow than on the right side of the arrow. And this was basically Brodman's life, is he was slicing brains, staining them, looking at them under a microscope. And he actually published, so his, his 1909 book is actually a comparative study of uh, neuroanatomy across a huge range of different species of animals. Uh, including humans, but you know many mammals, many non-mammals uh, as well. Uh, so he was obviously very good at finding these boundaries, just because he looked at the stuff a lot um, and had a good intuitive sense. But again, it's obviously very labor-intensive as well. The votes were doing similar work, but they were focused more on myeloarchitecture, which is looking at the connectivity uh, between different cells and how that differs across layers, rather than the cell types uh, and densities. Uh, and these are actually um, uh, maps from the votes uh, of different areas that were defined based on their myelarchitectonic work. And then uh, as they, they moved into the era where people started doing neurosurgery and doing electrical stimulation of the brain during neurosurgery, they were trying to map between uh, that sort of functional mapping, basically, and the cytoarchitectonics, which is what you're seeing uh, at the bottom there. And so you've probably seen some of these maps, and a number of these were produced throughout the 20th century, Brodman's being the one at the, the top left here, but lots of other variants, all of which were basically aimed at the same goal of parcelating out the brain based on distinctive features at the cellular uh, kind of level. Uh, and I already mentioned this, but just to sort of illustrate, uh, the cytoarchitecture is where you're looking at cell bodies and their distributions. The schematic is a little cleaner and prettier than the photos I showed you before. So you can sort of distinctly see the different uh, cortical layers there. And then over here, you've got a different stain that's staining for uh, the connections, uh, really for myelin. And you can see that some layers have more horizontal connections going through them. Some have more, uh, or the sort of the origin or the end point of vertical connections um, within that part of the cortex. Um, and so these things differ across the cortex and that's what's being measured. I'm going to skip over that one. Um, so we can sort of think about cortical organization on multiple scales. Um, so one is sort of micro, meso, macro, where micro is the cellular level, um, you know, of individual cells or even cortical columns, which is what I just skipped over. Um, and repetitive structures like retinotopic maps. So that's the fact that in the visual system, uh, like in primary visual cortex, an area of the visual cortex maps to an area in the visual field and adjacent areas in the visual field or adjacent areas in the cortex. Um, so there's that sort of microscopic kind of map. And then the meso level is really this level of uh, cytoarchitectonically defined areas and these different sort of chunks that you saw in the, the colored maps of the brains uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, so these can be defined by cytoarchitecture, myoarchitecture, um, and now people are also doing things like mapping receptor densities for different, you know, dopamine D1, D2 receptors or whatever, or looking at gene expression. Uh, and the way this is being done is quite different now as well, because rather than an individual staring at this through a microscope and making subjective informed, but nevertheless subjective and, and tedious uh, decisions about things, uh, the approach now is to take uh, postmortem brains, slice them really thin, uh, so like 20 to 200 micron um, thin slices, stain them, and then take digital microphotographs of them.
uh, and then scan those and apply computational image analysis to them. So rather than a human making judgments about cortical areas and so on, you can basically just quantify, um, identify different layers, quantify cell de densities and, and types, and uh, define boundaries um, like the ones shown by these lines here based on computations rather than subjective judgments based on the same thing. Um, you know, ultimately it's still cell densities and so on across layers. Uh, this is being done as part of the International Consortium of Brain Mapping, which is an international consortium of people who do brain mapping, um, as the name might suggest. Um, but uh, it's a big project and the goal is to take, uh, I think they have about a dozen post-mortem brains and you can imagine, you know, a hu whole human brain slicing at 20 microns or even 200 microns thick. That's a lot of slices. Um, and so even though this is fairly automated, it's still a very huge task uh, to try and do it. And there's basically one core group based in Ulich, Germany, uh, who are working on this. And so they're slowly getting through the brain, but it, it takes a long time. But the idea is to develop a probabilistic atlas of cytoarchitecture. Um, and this comes from the fact that very quickly as people started doing this and comparing across brains, they realized that the gross anatomy, so like where the, the gyri and sulci are, um, doesn't necessarily correspond to the boundaries of different cytoarchitectonic areas. And so, like traditionally, Broca's area is defined as the third frontal convolution or the inferior frontal gyrus, which is fairly distinct uh, thing to find anatomically. If you look at like a brain scan or a postmortem brain, there's a very distinct gyrus and it's, it's got a characteristic shape and approximate location in the brain. So it, it's, you know, with very minor degree of training, it's pretty easy to find that. And typically that's defined as Broca's area and it's thought of as both an anatomical area, but then also a functional area. But when they started doing this kind of um, uh, cytoarchitectonic mapping and then trying to relate that. So I should say also that they've uh, did structural MRIs of all these brains before they sli started slicing them up. So, and they know where each slice came from. So once they've done the cytoarchitecture, they can actually project that back to the whole brain. And they started finding that there wasn't a lot of consistency in say cytoarchitectonically defined Brodmann's area 45, which is part of Broca's area. And where you might decide that boundary was just based on where the sulci were. Sometimes it's on the top of the gyrus, sometimes it's down in, inside a sulcus, just depends on the individual. So that causes a lot of alarm because most of what we do with fMRI is based on this sort of gross anatomy and trying to line things up based on gross anatomy and say, you know, label brain areas based on, you know, sort of the bumps in the sulci. Uh, so the idea of the probabilistic atlas is to take all 12 people map out, say, Brodmann's area 45, project them onto the structural MRI, do spatial normalization so all the brains line up, and figure out how much overlap there actually is across individuals in that area. I'll get you in a sec. Um, and basically, you can the probabilistic atlas is you can go into the brain and click on an area and it'll say, like, you know, this is 95% likely to be Brodmann's area 45 and 5% likely to be Brodmann's area 44. And then as you get to the fringe areas, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, um, those probabilities sort of taper off. Question. So with doing the, like, slicing it so thin, it's mm -hmm. an insane amount of data, even with 12 brains, but when you're looking kind of at a broader scheme of things, 12 doesn't seem like a whole lot. So how are they taking in <coughs> structural asymmetries like with something even just as simple as like left-handed versus right-handed individuals yeah uh and that's just a, a fundamental limitation of the data set is that you're right 12 people isn't that representative of the human population so did they try to like keep it consistent they were like let's say with this one they were just like six males six females all right-handed all like kind of with the same general background or was i believe they're all right-handed uh there's actually a huge range in age uh, from I think about like 30 up to 80 uh, and I'm not quite sure there's both both sexes are represented but I'm not quite sure if it's 50-50 um, or not um, so you know I think the idea is to try and be broadly representative but also recognize that there are fundamental limitations of this yeah uh, so the approach computationally is uh, to define the, the sort of outer and inner uh, boundaries of the cortex. So, um, and then uh, draw lines perpendicular to those boundaries. So you're basically cutting right through the cortex and uh, take a measurement uh, across um, 
along those lines. And uh, as a function of depth in the cortex, measure the density uh, of cells. And so you get something that they call the gray level index, which is basically the uh, cell body density as a function of cortical depth. So this graph here represents one of those lines, so one of those slices through the cortex. And it's showing that there's relatively high densities of gray matter, say, sort of at layer 2, 3, uh, and in layer 6, not so much between layer 5 and 6, and so on. So this is sort of the profile of that one slice through the brain. So you can get these profiles basically continuously along the cortex and uh, then do comparisons. So the, ba the way that you find a boundary between brain areas is try and find a point at which this, this profile across the layers changes dramatically. So this is for area 44, Brodmann's area 44, this is for Brodmann's area 45, and you can see that the profiles are, you know, even to the, the average viewer, quite different. Uh, and so you can basically quantify these profiles in a, a multivariate kind of way, fancy, fancy math, and uh, start doing the comparisons and basically figure out an algorithm that'll tell you where the boundaries are based on these profiles changing quite dramatically. Obviously, they're going to change a bit from point to point, but Brodmann's original observation was that these boundaries were definable because there were quite distinctive changes in the profiles across the cortex. Uh, and this is all quite straightforward for uh, computers to do, right? So they can analyze the density using image recognition software. Um, those just become numbers and then all the algorithms um, just sort of go from there. So this is an example. They've actually put this on the web. So it's an interactive uh, web viewer where you can go on and choose a particular brain area or in this case, I, I just had it uh, show me all the brain areas, um, at least at the bottom there, sorry. I've all of a sudden got a different pointer. That's cute. <coughs> Don't know how that happened, but okay. I like this one better, actually. Um, so at the bottom here, you can basically see what they've mapped out, which is actually, at this point, a reasonable amount. So they've got motor cortex, somatosensory, a lot of parietal areas, a lot of visual areas. Um, sort of hard to tell from this angle. Auditory areas, but not all of the temporal lobes, uh, definitely not all of the frontal lobes. Um, these top ones here, what I'm showing is a probabilistic map for one area, I guess frontal pole. So the red is showing the greatest overlap between individuals, and then the blue is showing the least overlap between individuals. So you can sort of figure out what sort of core most likely to be this cytoarchitectonic area, and which areas are more sort of peripheral to that and more variable between individuals. So you can go on and look at this as well. This data is actually integrated into different fMRI analysis software so that once you've got your activation maps, you can actually click on different blobs of activation and inquire in the atlas, you know, which cytoarchitectonic area is this most likely to be. Um, so it's quite useful in that way. And it's a big step up because basically from, you know, almost day one of fMRI analysis software. They've had uh, ways of inquiring about things like uh, the names of brain areas, you know, gross anatomical labels, but also Brodmann areas. So Brodmann areas for a long time have been sort of a standard shorthand that neuroscientists have used for referring to different brain areas. Um, but usually based on Brodmann's original drawing from 1909, um, where he had like a nice line drawing of the brain and drew these areas on based on, you know, his experience of slicing through a brain and then trying to do that mapping um, by hand, basically. And as good as he was, you know, that's an N of one and fairly approximate. And then when people started doing this with fMRI, they basically looked at that two-dimensional line drawing of the brain and the different areas that Brodmann had labeled, mapped that onto uh, an MRI scan of one individual and said, okay, there's Brodmann's area 45. And everybody just sort of took that as, as gospel. Uh, and have used that. So the prob probabilistic atlas is obviously a significant step forward um, in that it's coming from like real data without a lot of um, hand drawings uh, in between. Um, so it's a lot more sophisticated and the biggest limitation is that there's a lot of brain areas that aren't yet mapped out and also the fact that you know even though it's probabilistic it's based on a relatively small sample so you know it's only going to be so accurate. Um, and as I mentioned, there are lots of different ways of mapping that people are employing now. Uh, so this can be done using cytoarchitecture, myeloarchitecture, but also what you're seeing over um, 
Well, over on the left, this is uh, parv albumin, so it's a gene expression map. And in all of these uh, images, what you're seeing is part of the occipital lobe between um, area V1, so primary visual cortex, and V2, secondary visual cortex. You can see a line defining a boundary based on gene expression, based on cytoarchitecture. C is myeloarchitecture, I believe. Uh, and then over on the right, you're seeing different uh, receptor mapping. So uh, this is GABA-A mapped with muscimol. This is GABA-A mapped with something else. Um, this is actually, that one's GABA-A as well. So three of them are GABA-A and one of them's GABA-B. So they're all inhibitory neurotransmitter maps, but based on uh, different ways of mapping two different receptor subtypes. And you can see that they actually give you, you know, they all define a boundary, um, more or less. You can see that they change in some way across that boundary, but they all give you somewhat different information as well. And that's a big challenge for the field now is saying, okay, well, you know, we were all excited about the fact that we had the cytoarchitecture that was based on humans and probabilistic and projected to the MRI, but that's only like one way of defining what a brain area is and other areas might give you different answers. Uh, and so we're still um, trying to figure all that out. Another approach that's been done is, uh, this was published a couple of years ago in Nature um, uh, with uh, Gl Glasser's, the, the first author, and this is another big project out of, uh, this is actually the Human Brain Mapping Project, so a big international consortium where they scanned um, a total of a thousand people um, so now you've got a big sample on a standardized protocol that included a number of different structural MR sequences and a number of functional MRI tasks. And what they've done here is define brain areas based on the sort of covariance between all of those different measures, so different structural measures and different functional measures. Um, so here what you're seeing is three different, so you've got the lateral view of the brain, so the outside basically left and right hemisphere, inside left and right hemisphere, flat map, so it's sort of the same thing, different views. Uh, and they've mapped it out using myelin, um, and the way you do this with uh, fMRI, or sorry, with structural MRI, is you do a T1 weighted structural scan and a T2 weighted structural scan, and you look at the ratio of the two, and that reflects myelin density, uh, apparently. Um, and here you've got a map of that, so you can see that, you know, like the motor strip has much higher density of myelin than other areas, um, so you can get a map that way. And then the gradient map is basically looking from point to point how much change is there. And so gradient maps basically define boundaries, right, because the biggest change is going to be a boundary between different areas. Um, so any given map that they have actually gives sort of two pieces of information, so the, that voxel has a, a certain density or quantity of some sort, and you have a measure of the gradient of how things change across that voxel from either side of it. So you've got that for myelin, you've uh, got that for cortical thickness, uh, and then this is task fMRI, so this is whatever, they had uh, a number of different sort of standard tasks, language, memory, perceptual, and so on. Uh, and then they also did resting state fMRI functional connectivity. Um, and using different seed voxels as ways of getting functional connectivity maps. So there's a massive amount of information here, and you can see that these don't necessarily highlight the same brain areas each time, but what they did analytically was basically say, um, how do we find like patterns of covariance? So across all of these different measures, if something is a distinctive brain area, it should respond in a, a sort of distinctive way from areas around it across these different things in some way. And maybe not everything, so not every brain area is going to light up, obviously, in every fMRI task, but it's maybe sort of consistently high on this one and low on this one and shows some myelin gradient changes and that sort of thing. So mass, you know, just sort of looking at the brain from a bunch of different structural and functional ways, push all that into a machine learning algorithm that's very good at finding patterns and, and correlations, guided by some expert knowledge. So they actually had humans involved in sort of making some judgments. And the end result was uh, these maps, uh, like this one, that identify basically 180 distinctive areas of the cortex in each hemisphere. And this is coming, you know, being driven entirely by the data. And it's, there's no cytoarchitectural data here. There's nothing other than the fMRI and structural MRI data. So it's all non-invasive human-based. But a lot of the areas that they find, like they've mentioned, so 44, that's Brodman's area 44, MT, 
is uh, also defined cytoarchitectonically. So a lot of the areas are very consistent with, uh, say, the probab probabilistic atlas for cytoarchitecture, but it's coming from an non entirely non-invasive way. So it holds a lot of promise. It doesn't tell us anything about the cytoarchitecture, but again, we would expect that these things correlate across scales, that if these boundaries are, are sort of being highlighted by structural things that we can measure at, at the MRI level and functional things, they probably reflect underlying differences in, in cytoarchitecture as well. But the great thing is, like again, going back to this question of you know how representative is that sample of 12 postmortem brains and how long that process takes to, to even map those out. This seems to hold a lot of promise that we don't necessarily need um, lots of postmortem brains. Um, we can actually get reliable maps from living humans uh, so it can potentially accelerate the progress. Through, you know, we could still then study how that relates to the micro architectural stuff, but at least we have a way of sort of moving forward without waiting on that work to be done. All right. Uh, and <clears throat> so that's sort of mapping out the brain and trying to find these different parcels and, and brain areas as defined by functional and structural measures. Uh, another approach using structural, um, another structural approach, I guess you could say, is morphometry, which is basically looking at the size and shape of brain areas and how that varies between individuals as a function of disease state or whatever. Um, so the original way that this was done um, as people started doing structural MRIs was using manual tracing. And so you'd have these sort of general guiding maps of the major sulci of the brain and the major gyri and labels and ways of, of uh, sort of defining how, how you would label those on an individual's brain. Some of them are fairly obvious, as I already said, uh, but some of them are a little more subtle, like especially along the temporal lobe here, so you've got the middle temporal gyrus, which is a, a gyrus that extends really from the front of the temporal lobe all the way back. But here it's been uh, broken up into three distinct areas, so T2A, T2P, and TO2. And so where you define those boundaries is based on landmarks that are derived from other brain areas. So a lot of it is sort of finding landmarks and using those to help you identify and parcelate things out, and then manually tracing those on individual slices of the brain. Um, and if you consider that structural MRIs are typically one millimeter thick slices, it's like you know 150 odd slices to get through the brain, and that's a lot of tracing. And I've done this work, and it doesn't go fast, and it's no fun, and it requires a lot of training. So the biggest downside is that you can't just sort of hand this off to undergraduate volunteers and do it in mass or do it on like Amazon Mechanical Turk or something like that. You really need people who are trained in brain anatomy uh, to do it, but it's really crappy work, and you typically can't pay them enough or just keep them interested enough in the task to keep them doing it for very long. Um, so there's a lot of sort of fundamental practical challenges around doing it. So people were very excited and motivated to come up with automated or semi-automated ways of doing it. Uh, so in the semi-automated approaches, there's still some manual tracing, but it's more like you're marking landmarks and then there are algorithms that do a lot of the filling in for you. Um, and that definitely helps um, move things along, improves reliability and reproducibility and so on. Um, but it still does define uh, or require some manual definition uh, of these areas. And a fundamental limitation is in all of these approaches, all you basically get is sort of, well, you've got brain areas labeled now, if you wanted to do fMRI or something, and then you have measures of the volume of different brain areas. And so you can look if brain areas are, are shrinking in some sort of d degenerative disease or between a disease state and a healthy state or something. But it's really just volume, which is, is kind of limited. And often, um, as you're tracing through, unless you segment into gray and white matter, it's just sort of volume of that area. And you don't really know if that's changes in white matter volume or changes in gray matter volume or more CSF. Hopefully not CSF, because that wouldn't be traced. Um, but it, it's, it, it's pretty limited in the kind of information you can get. So enter computational neuroanatomy methods. And these are basically ways of quantifying the spatiotemporal dynamics of the human brain structures in both normal and clinical populations at the macroscopic level. Um, so quantifying size uh, changes, um, but we can get a little more sophisticated than just sort of the overall volume and actually start looking at, you know, more like how do we quantify changes in the shape of some complex three-dimensional volume. Turns out mathematicians have, have thought about this stuff, and even though it's not necessarily intuitive, there are ways of quantifying it. Um, 
And all these rely on spatial normalization, which is how we line up our brains across individuals, because we know that like snowflakes, um, individual brains are very different in their size and their shape and even in their, their sort of overall uh, sulcal and gyral anatomy. There's some consistency, but there's also a lot of individual variability. So this was a problem right from the start of fMRI because as soon as you've run two people through an fMRI scan, uh, you can't just sort of overlay their brains and expect that the same brain area is going to line up in the two because they're different sizes and different shapes. Uh, so people started coming up with ways of normalizing or uh, warping brains to uh, uh, become the same shape. Um, the original way was actually developed for neurosurgery um, really prior to doing fMRI. Talarek and Turneau were two French neurosurgeons who published this atlas in 1988 where they basically mapped out the brain. You can actually see the Brodmann's areas are the little numbers there, like 46 and 45. And they'd find this grid that had a number of sections going front to back, a number of sections left to right, and you can't see it in this one, but top to bottom as well. And they basically said that you can coarsely align brains based on certain anatomical landmarks. And the, the key ones are these two lines that you see horizontally here are going through the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. So these are really small white matter bundles that connect the two hemispheres. We all know about the corpus callosum, that's a major white matter bundle connecting the two hemispheres. The anterior and posterior commissures are smaller, um, like mini corpus callosums. Uh, and they were chosen because they're present in virtually every brain. They're distinctive because they're, they're white matter, so they st sort of stand out brightly in scans, but they're quite small, so they're sort of like little dots. Uh, so, and they go horizontally. So you basically, you have these two points, you can find those and define the horizontal plane as like rotate the brain so that those two things are, are lined up on a horizontal line. Um, and then that defines, uh, so those two dots define a plane that sort of separates the top half of the brain from the bottom part of the brain, not technically halves, but top and bottom. And then you have three segments going front to back, right? So in front of the AC, the anterior commissure, between the anterior and posterior commissures and behind. And then you've got the very obvious sort of division between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So that gives you sort of three times two um, times two is, whatever it is. Not doing the math in my head today. A number of chunks of the brain, it's like 12 or something. Um, and uh, basically the, the idea is that you can map this out and then you can scale each of those chunks um, from your brain to some reference brain. So they picked a, a reference brain, they had one sitting around in a jar, uh, I think the story goes. Turns out it was like a, a, a woman who was in her 80s and probably drank too much. And the brain had been sitting in formaldehyde for a while, so it had sort of disfigured uh, in its shape. Um, but that was the one they had, and that's the one they did scans of and defined their atlas on. And so basically, you can take any brain and map it to the approximate size and shape of this old French woman's brain um, using this approach. And so it defines a coordinate system because right here, um, oh, look, I've got the other pointer back. It's a mystery. Um, so the, the intersection between the anterior commissure and the plane that separates the two cerebral hemispheres was defined as zero, zero, zero um, in this three-dimensional um, coordinate system. And so you could go from there, like the right hemisphere is positive in the X dimension, left hemisphere is negative in the X dimension, above the anterior commissure is positive in Z, below is negative in Z. So you have this 3D coordinate system and people started using that in fMRI basically to say, okay, I found activation at this XYZ set of coordinates. And so it creates a common system for people to be able to relate their brain maps to each other uh, across studies, as well as within a study scaling everybody's brains to the same size. But probably, at, you know, besides the poor choice of a reference brain, as you can imagine, this is kind of crude, right? Because we're basically just sort of scaling the overall size of a big chunk of the brain to some other one. So it's not capturing any individual variability in like the sural and jul jul whoa. <laughs> sulcal and gyral patterns um, or uh, any other subtleties in, in, in shape. So there's automated ways of doing this, which basically start by sort of rotating the brain and scaling the overall size of the brain and then in each dimension separately to best match your reference brain. Um, I'll talk about choice of reference brain in a minute, but we can imagine now whatever your reference brain is. Um, so you can basically sort of rotate and scale it to be approximately the same size. 
And then you can do a set of what are mathematically called linear affine transformations um, to scale it um, in each dimension separately and also sort of shear it, which means baking, making it more sort of trapezoidal. So if one person's brain is a little more pointy at the front, you can accommodate that pointiness rather than just sort of trying to make the whole thing narrower or wider. Um, so you can get an approximate fit that way. And then the next step is to do a nonlinear warping, um, which is basically uh, allowing things to sort of ripple uh, a bit to get a better, f so that's where you're going to fit more to the shape of the sulcal and gyral patterns uh, of an individual brain. And so what you're seeing here is when you do nonlinear warping, you go, you start with your slice of brain, nice square voxels, and s those voxels are going to get all distorted. Um, so some are going to get bigger, some are going to get shrunk, they're going to get shape, you know, change differently along different dimensions. And so they don't even end up square anymore. Um, and then in the output, you would re-slice the brain so that they become square voxels again. Um, but in your, in your re-sliced brain, that new voxel is going to con contain information from maybe multiple areas around it as things got sort of warped and, and so on. Um, but you do get uh, quite a good fit. So here, this is our template brain. And then over here is the individual subject's brain that we're trying to map to that template. And what you can see is this is the result of linear registration. <coughs> You've just seen two different slices through the brain here. Um, and then this is the result of nonlinear re registration. And what's important to see, there's sort of two things that are important to see here. One is that neither of these actually looks like the template. So normalization isn't perfect. It doesn't totally make your brain look like the reference brain. It gets it approximately correct and is overall sort of same size and shape and as good a mapping as is feasible given the kind of algorithms you have. Um, but it does preserve a level of difference, which is important because if we want to look at differences in brain structure, we don't want to erase all those differences, but we want to sort of find the, the sweet spot where we've matched things broadly. We, we have a pretty good alignment, but we pr preserve some of those differences. But you can also see that the nonlinear registration gives you a better fit, so it looks more like the template than the linear registration. Um, and so that nonlinear step is important in, in getting a, a reasonably good fit. At the bottom, what you're seeing is when you do just the linear registration, they've just sort of defined the um, uh, one particular sulcus there, separating the occipital from the parietal lobes uh, across a bunch of individuals. And then this is with nonlinear. And you can basically, it's just showing that you get much better overlap between individual subjects when you use the nonlinear registration. So this is used in fMRI, uh, but it's also critical to do in structural MRI. I'm going to jump right to, yeah. I've talked about some of the stuff. We're pretty much out of time. Um, so I just want to very quickly touch on these um, three computational morphometry uh, approaches. So the first one is voxel-based morphometry. This is uh, really the oldest one um, and, and maybe the fuzziest in terms of what you're doing because basically you spatially normalize the brains, as I've said, and this can either be at two time points. So if you're doing a longitudinal study, it'd be sort of the start and the end points. Uh, or if it's cross-sectional, you're comparing between um, uh, different groups. Obviously, given that the normalization is only approximately right, um, doing it within subjects is better. So the longitudinal studies are probably more reliable in that sense, because it's the same brain. Um, so any differences should be due to real changes in the brain and not just errors in normalization or something like that. So you're re removing the gross anatomical differences, at least down to a particular level of spatial resolution defined by your scan and then the normalization algorithm. Uh, and uh, you multiply each voxel value by the relative volume before and after warping. So the warping being the spatial normalization. So those voxels, remember from the slide I showed you a couple slides ago, they change their size. And um, so by including this, we're basically sort of implicitly including some quantification of how much size change. So how different is uh, that voxel between time one and time two, or between this group and that group. Um, apply some spatial smoothing. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then you compute the differences between brains. So you imagine that this is, let's stick with the longitudinal study, so it's the same brain. Um, say we're looking at disease progression in Alzheimer's again. Um, so certain brain areas are going to atrophy. Gray matter is going to get thinner, basically. And so you take the brain at time point one, brain at time point two, normalize them. The differences 
um, between those brains should be pretty minimal because it's the same individual, but where there's been cortical thinning or atrophy, you, you should see uh, changes in those specific voxels. So if you're chain comparing each voxel between the two time points, you're going to quantify where there are the biggest changes occurring in these, these measures. Um, skip over that, not really that important. Um, so what you're measuring is what they call gray matter concentration. The sort of caveat here is that that's, you know, we're not actually quantifying cell bodies directly. We're still using structural MRI, which is basically, remember, that's like the ratio of fat to water. Um, the gray matter is mostly cell bodies, so it's sort of watery. Um, but it does quantify, to some extent, how much of that voxel is gray matter, um, as opposed to white matter. Um, and microstructural properties, we don't fully understand that, but you know, the cell bodies are contributing to that. And also because we've smoothed, it's not just actually that point in the brain, but sort of a, a general representation of the area around it. And again, quantifying the amount of volume change that occurred in that voxel. So it's sensitive both to changes in sort of gray matter density, which could be like how many cell bodies are there, or other things, cells breaking down. Um, to some extent, it's going to be sensitive to the thickness uh, of the cortex and also the amount of change that occurs uh, over time. And it's been used a lot, um, but as you probably are getting the sense, it's a bit fuzzy in terms of what we're quantifying. Um, and that's just a fundamental limitation of the technique, but it's still been used quite a lot in studies both of disease progression, um, effects of treatment on disease progression, and even in things like learning, there have been some um, fairly highly cited studies showing that uh, some time, kinds of intensive training actually change these gray matter uh, quantifications, suggesting there's like cell body growth or something like that. But there's some other measures that have been developed that uh, have a bit more of an intuitive interpretation and uh, deformation-based morphometry is one of them. So what we're looking at here is the 3D deformation field. So all of these measures are really based on metrics that come out of doing that spatial normalization. So you're warping the brain using a nonlinear transform to adjust each brain to match the template. And then you look at how much change there's been. And you can also do sort of pre-post uh, kind of changes in, in normalization. And with DBM, what you're looking at is this 3D deformation field that represents the amount of movement uh, a voxel, each voxel experienced during the normalization. And so you can see here that it's representing the slice of an image. You can, if you squint, it kind of maybe looks like a brain. But each point in the image is being represented by a little tiny arrow that indicates the direction that that voxel moved and how much it moved. Uh, so some of the ones, especially around the outside, are effectively showed no movement or very little movement because they're outside the brain, didn't really have to change. Within the brain, you can have varying degrees of the amount and direction of movement. And that's representing in you know, some way how different this person's brain is from the template brain. Because the more it has to move, the more different it is. And so between different groups or over time, you can see if there's sort of increases or decreases in the change. And to some extent, it's, it's sensitive to the shape, but really you're getting uh, the shape in sort of a, a voxel by voxel kind of way rather than any sort of gross measure of shape. Um, so it does reflect the amount of shape difference between groups in, in some sort of way. And the complexity with DBM is that you actually get uh, three values per voxel. So you get the movement in each of the three primary directions, x, y, and z. And so instead of having one number at each voxel, you actually have three, which makes the stats much more complicated because normally we have one value like the bold signal at that voxel or a z value or something like that. Here we actually have three different things. And so it requires multivariate statistics where if you think about sort of the, if you've taken stats, you get the gener general linear model that's used in most of these things where basically you have y on one side of the equation and x and some other stuff on the other side of the equation. So y is your dependent variable. So rather than just having a y, you actually have like x, y, z on, on that side and you're trying to predict all three. So the stats are more complicated. Multivariate stats are typically taught in like graduate uh, psychology programs a little bit, but people aren't as familiar with them. And so that actually becomes a barrier to using this technique is that people don't necessarily come into it understanding the stats as well as they might with uh, some of the other techniques. And then the results are a little harder to interpret because you can get sort of some quantification of 
the overall amount of change, but then you also get these uh, sort of three different directions that you're, you're trying to quantify. So it's a, a little more complex uh, to, oop, uh, to interpret. But regardless, it, it does uh, give you some measure of the amount of shape change, and it's localized, right? So you get it voxel by voxel. Uh, so it's a nice complement, at least, to the, the VBM method. And then finally, there's tensor-based morphometry, or TBM. And this is, again, based on changes that occur as a result of the, the normalization. But rather than looking at the direction, you're actually capturing sort of more the, the amount of change. And it's coming out of something called the Jacobian matrix, which is just part of the, the math that's involved in computing these uh, spatial normalizations. But if you look here over on, let's see, if we start over on the right, uh, you can see that, again, we've got a slice of brain, and each voxel here is represented by a circle instead of by an arrow. And that circle is basically representing the amount of shape change that the voxel underwent. But rather, th whereas DBM is representing the direction of the change and sort of the amount of change in a particular direction, this is quantifying the overall volume change. And it uh, takes into account things like, uh, and now this is where we look over on the left, so you've got the original image where all the voxels were square, but after the nonlinear warping, some of these voxels are going to become effectively not square, uh, right? They're going to sort of get squished or stretched in, in different directions. It's a little bit confusing because the end result of the normalization is a new brain image where all the voxels are square again, because it basically does this kind of warping and then re-slices the image into a nice grid. So your MRI image that you get out is always a nice set of square voxels. But what we're doing with the, the uh, TBM is quantifying the change that occurred before we re-sliced. Uh, so you can have these uh, sort of shifts, stretches, and squishes rotations, and also just gross volume changes. So some parts of the brain might have to be sort of expanded or shrunk uh, in order to best match uh, the other one. And so the Jacobian matrix captures this information that sort of combines the effects of the translation, rotation, and volume change. Uh, the nice thing is that the end result is a single. It sort of combines those into one measure of the overall volume change as a result of those things. So you don't need the multivariate stats that you needed with uh, the DBM. So it's easier stats, but it sort of implicitly captures all of these different shape changes into one number and quantifies that. And what you're seeing here on the bottom left is uh, the, um, the brain after the, the shape change. So again, you can see these voxels that now have these sort of weird shapes that represent the amount of change. And then this uh, image on the right is quantifying that in the kind of values that you'd be using for your, your actual TBM stats. So dark represents shrinkage, and white, the brighter white, represents enlargement of individual voxels. So you can sort of look at that and tell which parts of the brain are sort of shrinking and which parts are expanding relative to a previous time point or a control group or whatever your, your reference is uh, in that sort of thing. All right, so both TBM and VBM capture volume changes. VBM combines that with that sort of gray matter thing, whereas uh, TBM is more of a pure measure because it's just quantifying the volume change of the voxels without the gray matter concentration piece. Um, so in a sense, TBM is, is a little easier to interpret, but it may not, because it's measuring something different, you may see differences in one measure or, or the other, or you may see sort of different magnitudes of difference in the two measures, because one is just capturing the change in size of the brain at a local level, whereas the VBM is actually also measuring changes in gray matter concentration. So if you've got something like atrophy, your cells are actually sort of dying or shrinking and less cells, you're going to get an effect that would be detected with the VBM method, but not with the TBM method, which probably now it might those loss of cells or whatever might actually cause volume changes as well. Um, but they, they are measuring related but different things, and so they might have different sensitivities. And again, as with you know all of these structural measures, the biggest challenge that we have is we get these measures, they're measures that we can get out of MRI, so we do them, and they seem to be sensitive to certain changes that occur in disease states, but trying to relate them to what's actually going on at the cellular level is still a gap that we haven't really uh, crossed, 
right? So we, we don't fully know how to interpret these measures, but nevertheless, if you're studying a clinical population or following people clinically and you want to know how much atrophy is occurring or you're trying some treatment and you want to see if that treatment is sort of delaying or slowing atrophy compared to a control group, these methods are the best methods we have of doing something non-invasively to quantify these sort of structural changes that are occurring in the brain. So they're still useful even if we don't fully understand what's going on kind of under the hood, if you will, at the cellular level. Then finally, we have the cortical thickness measures. These are a little more intuitive. Again, lots of different things could, in principle, cause changes in cortical thickness, but at least cortical thickness is the thickness of the cortex. So that's kind of an easily interpretable, conceptual sort of thing to do. And there's two different ways of quantifying this with a structural MRI. One's called voxel-based cortical thickness. And here, um, the maybe what we do is start with this image on the right. Um, this is showing something slightly different, but it helps you think of things in terms of sort of the square voxels that we have, right? And so there are image processing techniques that are able to segment the gray matter from the white matter from the CSF in an MRI image because they're rather different intensities. And so you can isolate just the gray matter uh, in an image and sort of mask out, blank out the, the white matter in the CSF. Then you've got the gray matter and then you can start measuring its thickness in terms of the number of voxels or, or sort of part voxels um, uh, for the cortex. It's going to be thicker, obviously, where you've got uh, cell sci, especially if there's small cell sci, which is what you're trying to see here, and there's algorithms for, for trying to measure that. But basically, you're isolating the gray matter and then quantifying the thickness in terms of voxels. And what you're seeing on the, the bottom left here is an example of the kind of data you'd get uh, out of that. So this is actually, I forget offhand what the study was, but um, looking at cortical thickness, um, uh, this was a change over time. I think it was an aging study, right? So you've got the, the mean thickness at the top, so you can see some areas in red have thicker cortex, some areas in blue are the ones that have thinner cortex. Uh, and then the bottom one is a thickness decrease in millimeters per year. So in this case, it's a longitudinal study where you're studying change over time. And you can see that, you know, some areas are thick, but they don't necessarily show a lot of change over time whereas other areas show more change uh, over time. And then the bottom map is just showing that you can do stats, so you can quantify and then measure changes in time, apply statistics, and look at which areas change significantly in thickness, which is a little hard to see here, but there's some areas that are sort of more red, um, so showing a higher T-score than other areas. So that's a voxel-based method. It's a bit, a bit limited because it's kind of a coarse measure and that you're looking at voxel by voxel. And uh, that algorithm that's uh, sort of defining the gray matter from the white matter, it has to make kind of this binary decision. And what's really happening, if you think about an MRI image, it's like you're applying a grid to the brain and then each voxel has an intensity value. So some that are brighter are going to be categorized as white matter, some that are darker are going to be categorized as gray matter. It's going to apply some threshold and say, okay, this one's in the gray matter, so we're keeping it. This one's in the white matter, so we're not. And so what you lose is where your, your voxels are sort of cutting through the gray matter, white matter boundary. Those are going to have intermediate values of intensity, and they're sort of going to be, you know, some might be above threshold, some might be below. So it's a bit imprecise in defining the actual edges uh, of the cortex, and so your thickness measures are going to be uh, compromised by that to the extent that that's true. Uh, and as well, you have this potential that the, you know, what they're really trying to show here is that this is actually a sulcus, but if you didn't have an algorithm that properly t detected that it was a sulcus, you just say, oh, there's a super thick segment of cortex right here. Uh, and so it's sort of finding these areas and then it has to artificially create this sort of white space in between to, so that the cortical thickness measure is really sort of done on each side of the sulcus rather than that, that full depth. And that, although the algorithm is there to try and correct for that, that's kind of another inherent limitation of the technique is that that might not be perfect. The other approach, not that any technique is perfect, uh, but the other approach is called surface-based cortical thickness. And what this is doing is kind of a different method. Now, it's still susceptible to the fact that you have to make some sort of judgment between what's gray matter and what's white matter and find that boundary. But the way it's defining the, the um, 
everything is in terms of surfaces. So if you think back to some previous lectures, I talked about spatial normalization and using a spherical based model. Um, and when I was talking about source localization, like with MEG, we talked about uh, how they form a model of the surface of the brain, because you want to constrain your source localization just to the gray matter, right, and not to the white matter and the other types of tissue. And so you form this tessellated model of the surface, which is basically points that are connected to each other to form in sort of triangles. And the nice thing about that is you can represent it mathematically as a surface now, so basically a 2D plane that has some folds and that sort of thing, but you can also inflate it, as opposed to a 3D image composed of a bunch of, of cubes, basically. It's now essentially a flat surface, and you treat it that way. And so this approach is taking that kind of mathematical approach, so you find the, the boundary of the white matter, and that forms the inner boundary of the gray matter and then you find the CSF and that defines the outer boundary and you're basically just measuring the difference between them. So rather than sort of categorizing gray matter as gray matter, you're defining gray matter as the space between the, the edge of the white matter and the edge of the CSF and computing the distance through that. And when you define it as a surface, it becomes very easy to sort of say, okay, the, you know, the thickness is sort of the, the the orthogonal dimension to these, these two planes that are defined by the surface. Uh, so in principle, it's a more accurate measure. It's a lot more computationally intensive. Uh, so it takes more time to compute, slower, just sort of slower progress. But at the same time, it's not infeasible. You don't require like massive computers or anything like that. Strong work workstations will work. Uh, and uh, again, it's been used in lots of studies. And so this is just an example. So at the top here, you're seeing the representation of the inner surface. Uh, so that's basically sort of the white matter. And then the outer surface, which is where the, the CSF is defined. And then we're computing the difference between those. And uh, the example that I chose is from a study looking at a couple of different kinds of neurodegeneration dementias. Um, one is uh, progressive non-fluent aphasia. So aphasia is a, a language, an acquired language disorder. It's usually caused by things like stroke or brain damage, but there's also a progressive kind that's uh, just, uh, we don't even necessarily know what causes it. But it's just something where there's no incident, but just slowly your language uh, abilities decrease over time. And it was already known that it was related to especially temporal lobe atrophy. But the study quantified that using the surface-based method and showed that indeed the, the cortical thickness was decreasing the most in the anterior parts and inferior parts of the temporal lobe, especially in the left hemisphere, consistent with language deficits. Uh, and then, so they had a control group of healthy people, but they also had a control group of people who had another kind of dementia, semantic dementia, which is uh, more like Alzheimer's, but more around uh, sort of conceptual things rather than full-blown language, and showed that the cortical thickness changes occurred they were less pronounced in more anterior parts of the temporal lobe and also in some frontal areas. So it's a way of, again, trying to understand disease states and progression of disease by looking at a structural measure. But in this case, it's uh, specifically the thickness of the cortex rather than the, uh, you know, the morphometry measures that are based more uh, around the size and shape of the brain as opposed to the thickness of the cortex. Personally, I think cortical thickness is just a little more intuitive to interpret, um, but it doesn't mean that's it. the only thing people should look at. The other ones are also obviously very useful as well. All right, so that's it for structural MRI. Any questions uh, just as I'm switching over? Okay. Oh, no, there we go. All right. So the next one is uh, on connectomics, but before we do that, I wanted to just promote our Neuro Hackathon, which is coming up this weekend. Uh, it's free, it runs all weekend, Friday evening, free food, uh, all day Saturday, Sunday. It's around brain-computer interfaces, so we're going to be focusing on EEG, which is something you guys are, are very familiar with, but rather than the application that we're using it for in class, which is we design an experiment, manipulate some stimuli and see what, look at some component and quantify how it changes. With brain computer interfaces, we're using some pretty well established components like uh, uh, frequency domain stuff around the motor cortex and the P300 and using those measures, trying to evoke them to actually control some sort of interface. 
Um, uh, we did this last year. It was a lot of fun. People got a lot out of it, I think. Uh, we call it a hackathon, but you don't actually have to know coding uh, to do it. We've got software packages that are fairly intuitive to use that don't require coding, some that involve uh, actually M&E, which you guys are also familiar with, uh, but we'll have a lot of support. So definitely, if you're interested, come and check it out. Um, don't feel, um, you guys are probably the most qualified people at Dow to, to actually do this hackathon anyway because you've taken this class. Uh, so yeah, um, so find more at our website and various other places. All right.